Nga mihi nui ki a koutou ko Sasha Nori ahau e tu mahakiana i te huitahi ai tātou. For those of you who, like me, don't speak much Māori, I just said, what's up? My name's Sasha and I feel really humbled to be here with you all, like a tiny tadpole in a room of big fishies. Maybe? No? Oh, that way. Cool. Um, so I represent an organisation called Just Speak, and we're a non-partisan network of young people from across Aotearoa who are really energised about contributing to the discussion of criminal justice. Um, so we believe that as a new generation of thinkers, um, we can work for change within our justice system using imagination, innovation, and evidence and experience-based um, discussion. So we recognise that young people are more diverse than we have ever been before in Aotearoa, that there is no single uh, young person's perspective, um, and rather we aim to empower young people from all walks of life to think independently about justice issues, to foster learning from others, and to carve out the new generation's rightful place at the policy table. So a big mihi to the Drug Foundation for having us along today. Thank you. Cool, so given that um, young people's experiences of drugs and the justice system are so diverse, it's really important for me to acknowledge the position from which I speak personally today. So I am Pākehā, I am educated, and I come from a loving and supportive family. So these three factors mean that I am automatically part of a privileged demographic of young people in Aotearoa. It also means that, that for these reasons alone, I am significantly less likely to come into contact with the criminal justice system. And that's not something that sits comfortably with me. It's a sad and I think really unacceptable reality that a disproportionate number of those young people who are welcomed into our justice system are not Pākehā. They've disengaged from education from an early age. They have parents who abuse drugs and alcohol. They live in poverty and they have few safe places to stay. So it's really important for us to remember that when we talk about youth and drugs in the justice system, that we're also uh, thinking about a range of the interconnected social, economic, and cultural issues. Um, and as you all know by now, from what everyone's touched on already, it's really difficult to talk about cannabis and the law without thinking about uh, mental and physical health, without thinking about gangs and poverty and cultural marginalization, education and welfare. So for these reasons, it would be wrong of me uh, not to acknowledge the privilege of the position that I hold, but also the limitations of my perspective. Um, I do find it incredibly heartening that we're all here today, excited about having these challenging conversations. Um, but my suggestion is that if we want to create effective and sustainable policies, then we have to engage directly with those people who these policies will ultimately affect. Cool, so after my giant disclaimer, um, today I'm going to touch on four broad questions that I believe should be in the forefront of our minds when we're thinking about um, young people, about drugs and about the justice system. First, it's really important for us to define who young people are in the context of this discussion. Because the criminal justice system has a particular definition of youth that doesn't necessarily reflect um, the, the evidence about who young people are and what their needs might be. Second, it's important to know uh, what kinds of drug-related behaviours uh, we are actually criminalising and whether our response to these uh, drug-related behaviours or offending is proportionate and effective. And if we decide that it's not particularly effective, um, we'll move at uh, how, how should we look to the future, how could we go on from here. Cool. So the criminal justice system treats young people and adults very differently. Uh, the youth system is based on notions of accountability and redemption, whereas, as Kylie touched on, the adult system is focused on punishment and deterrence. New Zealand's really lucky to have um, a world-leading youth justice system that is specifically designed to reflect that adolescent offenders are at a certain stage in their development. Um, the youth approach is based on the principle that it's best to keep young people out of the justice system and to avoid labelling them as criminals for as long as you can, because as soon as you do that, you create a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
So our system holds young offenders accountable for their actions while addressing the underlying causes of offending. Rehabilitation is strongly emphasized um, and if we engage with the reasons of, of why young people are offending, there's a better likelihood that we can prevent them from graduating to the adult system. So the evidence shows that the youth system gets better outcomes for offenders, victims, their families, and the wider community. And it's also a heck of a lot cheaper than the adult system, which tends to be the major concern of the average taxpayer when it comes to criminal justice. And because the criminal justice system treats young people and adults so differently, we have to be really careful about how we define youth. So in most areas of our legal system, um, a young person becomes an adult when they're 18 years old. Until you're 18, uh, a young person is not allowed to vote, to buy alcohol or tobacco, you're not allowed to enlist in the, in the military without consent. And the basis for making the legal age 18 is that before this stage, um, the state and we as a community deem that you're in need of guidance and protection and it's not appropriate to, to start treating you like an adult. However, in the eyes of the criminal justice system, a young person becomes an adult when they're 17 years old. This means that instead of going through the youth system, when you're 17, you get tried in adult courts and you go to adult prisons. So why is this relevant to cannabis? Uh, I'm sure there's many more people who are qualified in this room to attest to the fact that research into the development of the adolescent brain shows that decision-making and cognitive functions are not fully developed at 17. So teenagers who are experimenting with cannabis and other drugs actually have less capacity to analyze risk and to make decisions informed by potential negative outcomes. And although the science and the social evidence doesn't draw an arbitrary line between when you are a young person and when you are an adult, the criminal justice system does. Uh, so Just Speak has recently campaigned to have the age of the youth jurisdiction raised and believe that all 18 year olds should come, under 18 year olds should come under the youth system so that they have the benefit of these youth focused processes that can address the causes of offending and hopefully uh, prevent them beco from becoming more serious and lifelong offenders. So I pose the question to you before we move forward is do we really want to catch young people for minor drug offenses at such a pivotal stage of their development, um, introduce them to the justice system, and then propel them along a trajectory of increasingly uh, serious offending? And is this a response that you think is proportionate to the risk posed by that young person to the community? And while Just Speak has no particular position on the criminalization or decriminalization of any substance, we strongly urge against policies and mechanisms that are likely to see more people, and especially young people, um, brought before the courts for minor drug offences. Because although the, the prescribed penalties may be quite small, the impact of conviction and the experience of being in the justice system can have massively significant and long-lasting consequences, not only for these young people, but for their families and their entire communities. Cool, so what kind of drug offences do young people actually commit? Um, despite public perce perception, drug-related offences make up a relatively small proportion of all youth offending. So in 2012, um, illicit drug offences made up only 4% of total youth apprehensions. And the vast majority of this, or 97% of these, were the possession or use of cannabis. Over the past 20 years, we've seen a decrease in the apprehension rates um, for drug-related offences. So that's how many people the police are picking up for drug-related offences, which should be a really positive sign. Um, unfortunately, while the rates of young people that the police are picking up for drug-related offences, the number of prosecutions or the number of young people that the police are then sending to court has almost doubled. Um, and the warnings that the police are giving out, sort of tell you off, send you on your way, that's dropped by 30%. So that means that every year an additional 55 young people are being faced with going to court for the possession and use of what is most of the time cannabis. And this response is, is a response that's meant to be reserved only for the most serious of offenses. And it really begs the question, in, in the past 20 years, what's changed? Why has this changed? If 
the police are apprehending a consistent number of young people and prosecutions nearly doubled, we really need to start taking a close look at how police are exercising their discretion. When a young person is apprehended for an offence, the police do have a number of options available to them. They can give them a warning, send them to youth aid, you can do a family group conference, or if it's deemed appropriate, you can put them before the courts and prosecute them. And because prosecution is intended for the most serious of offences, um, within the police policies is uh, a mandate to divert young people away from the formal system as best they can. And as Kylie touched on earlier, calling into question the, dis the discretionary decision-making processes of our institutions is a really challenging thing to do. But because our youth system is based on this principle that interventions should correlate with the level of risk posed, um, it's really alarming to see that the number of young people being sent to court for low-level drug offending has, has doubled, even though we know that this is not what's best for those young people in these situations, and even though the police have a mandate not to do so. Uh, Just Speak has also done some research into the prosecution rates of young Māori versus young non-Māori. And the evidence tells us, again, that you are vastly more likely to be prosecuted after apprehension if you're Māori than if you're non-Māori in every category of offending. Um, and drug-related offences are no exception. So 17% of all Māori um, for drug possession or use uh, are likely to be prosecuted as opposed to the 15% of non-Māori. And because only Māori make up such a small proportion of our demographic, roughly 14%, the figures paint a pretty disproportionate picture when you look at them contextually. And of course all statistics do need to be approached with a degree of caution, um, but these numbers provide a really interesting platform to start engaging with these discussions. And as we move forward, we really need to start asking for explanations as to why there might be this institutional bias within our system. And if this bias is starting with low level offending in young people, what are the implications that that has for these young people, their families, and their communities in the future? So although drug offences only make up such a small proportion of youth uh, offending, studies show that drug and alcohol use or addiction is one of the most frequent motivators for crime. So many young people that go to court or who go to jail um, fail to get the help that they need with their mental health issues and substance abuse problems. So of the three and a half thousand young people under the age of 17 who came before the courts in 2011, 80% had substance abuse issues. But of the 2,800 of these young people that had drug and alcohol problems, judges made only 18 orders for treatment programs. So when we're thinking about responding to the treatment needs of these young people, it's also really important for us to look at drug use and dependency contextually. Because we know that young people offend in the context of their families and of their communities. So we need to start asking the tricky questions. How do we respond to a young person who comes from an environment of severe drug abuse and addiction? If our legal system assumes shared values about criminalization and punishment, what happens when some communities just accept that drug use and jail time are simply facts of life? How do we rehabilitate a young person who was never really habilitated to begin with? And can we really a person address a young person's substance abuse needs without also simultaneously uh, addressing issues of mental health, education, poverty, and other social and cultural factors? And as Kylie mentioned, there's definitely a shift in consciousness towards creating systems um, and solutions that take an interdisciplinary approach to rehabilitation, and Just Speak is really excited to be on that waka. Cool, so I realize that I've posed many more questions and have many more questions than I do answers. Um, and rather than feeling overwhelmed at the complexity of the issues, I actually feel really energized about the possibility for dynamic and creative solutions. Um, a number of progressive initiatives are being set up in Aotearoa within our youth justice system and attracting international praise. So the diversionary approach that I spoke about, which is the main feature of our youth justice system, 
um, is also one of its biggest successes. And while it does raise concerns about the potential for differential treatment that I touched on uh, earlier, any progress that's made towards keeping young people out of the court system is uh, something that needs to be celebrated. Uh, we also have a number of novel approaches to the court system that are being trialled uh, within our community and that are largely producing successful outcomes. So the Christchurch Youth Drug Court is an initiative that's aimed at reducing offending related to drug and alcohol dependency amongst young people. And I'm really excited to hear Judge McNeekin's corridor later, so we'll leave that safely in her hands. Um, the intensive monitoring group is another specialised court system that's being developed to target the needs of young offenders, and that's based on the model of the, the youth drug court. And it's a, a therapeutic intervention which um, targets young people with moderate to severe mental health needs and who pose a high risk of reoffending. So it works with them uh, very closely, one-on-one, -on -one, with judges and social workers, um, monitors, them in, monitors them intensively and really supports that young person um, with the hope of improving their outcomes. So finally, what I'm most excited about is the fact that within this room here is an incredible wealth of knowledge uh, from a broad variety of disciplines. So each of you bring your own perspectives and expertise to this corridor. And it's through the sharing of ideas and experiences that we will be able to collectively reimagine um, innovative and creative solutions to these really tricky problems. So my parting challenge to you is to acknowledge that the voices of those who most need to be heard on these issues are not represented here today. And if we're serious about creating meaningful and sustainable change without, within our justice system, we need to be learning from those who have experienced these policies at the grassroots. Uh, so the best way to know what young people need is to ask them. Kia ora